Hey, hey everybody, welcome back to Big Bike BMX. It's your friend Isaac, and uh, I've got my trusty co-host, 80s BMX Craig in the house. Say hi, Craig. Yo, what's up, everyone? Welcome. So, Craig, what was it about maybe a week and a Okay, so this, this next guest has been one that we've talked about, like, this is like one of those, like, wouldn't it be cool if guests, and about what, maybe like, a, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago, a week ago, uh, you said, sit down and then call me. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of like where it started. But in the back of my mind, um, I have a, a who's who list of guests who I want to see on the show. And of course, we're going to introduce that guest. But and I'll tell you why I chose this guest uh, as soon as you're done here. Okay, so I get a text message and, and Craig's just like, hey, man, uh, you need to sit down and then call me. And so then I, I'm thinking like, okay, something horrible has gone on. And then he, he, he answers the phone right away. And he's like, dude, you're never going to guess uh, who, who, who said they will come on the show. And so with that, I will introduce um, a legend in the, normally our audience is just big bike, bike life guys. But, but this guest is a legend in all of bikes. We have today uh, John Bulgens with us today from Haro Bikes. John, welcome. Hello. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hello. Thank, thanks for having me. This is awesome. I, I still can't believe that this is happening right now, and I'm literally watching it happen. Um, Craig, tell us, tell us the story. Like how, tell us like what went down. Okay, so uh, you know, John, from from way back, obviously, um, kind of knew who you were. But I, the way I first got to start looking at what you were doing and where you were at and where you came from was your Haro collection. So, John, if you guys don't know, and you probably want to go Google this out, uh, John had one of the most exclusive and largest um, retro Haro bike collections that ever was on the face of the earth. I mean, John, I mean, you could probably tell us more, but uh, this was pretty, uh, pretty amazing, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I spent 21 years and collected 128 Harrow Freestyler Pro models. I only collected the top end models. So from my 1982 Freestyler, it was the 106th ever made, but it was fully unrestored. So I had graphite ones on it, uh, um, you know, the snake bellies, it had, uh, yeah, the uh, MX 1000s. I mean, uh, God, it's, when, when you're going through all of this, like it, it takes three years. You guys know when you're restoring a bike, it normally takes about three years to get all era correct parts. I mean, I get people still hitting me up today. Have you got any 1982 Diacompi cables? I mean, that was some of the hardest things to get, like original 82 dated stamped 1982 cables and uh, the uh, shotgun seat. I mean, there's so much went into that bike, the KKT pedals, um, Redline Flight 401s. I mean, I'm not reading the script here. It's like, because I can visualize what it took to build that one bike. Then I went 82, 83, 84 Sport, 84 Master, 85 Sport, 85 Master, 86 Sport, 86 Master, 87 Sport, regular Sport, then Team Sport, Team Master, 88s, 89s, all the bash guards, every bash guard that was ever done all the way through to modern day. And then, uh, yeah, then I started creating lineage, a creation of its ancestor from all the bikes that I rode back in the day to then bring them to, to you guys to, to ride and enjoy and thrash, please thrash them because that's what they're built for. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, isn't that incredible? Uh, Isaac, uh, he's right. You know, it takes so much time to get a bike correct. And he started with a, back in 82, right, John? Um, I started, I got my, I, I got taken to the BMX track in 82 and I got my first BMX bike in March 83. So I just coming out of, I've just come out of juvenile hall. We can go into that conversation later, but uh, I had just come out of juvie at 10 years old. I was taken to see ET. My dad's, my new father saw how poor I was of just flying out of here in the BMX and everyone listening can understand what it feels like to ride that BMX for the first time. And that's why you're still doing it. And uh, yeah, so I went to the BMX track and that's when you would borrow bikes to see if you liked BMX. And then like three months later for my 
six days before my 11th birthday. So yeah, 1983, March 10th, 1983, I got my first BMX. And uh, six days later was actually my birthday. So yeah, I remember it was a Saturday and my birthday was on a Friday. So instead of going a day after my birthday, my parents took me there six days before to get my first BMX. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and what an incredible story. I hope we get into a little bit more later. But let me ask you this, because I have like maybe 13 to 15 bikes currently in my garage and it's packed. Where do you keep all these bikes, especially from a young age or when you start collecting? And we'll probably get into it a little bit more later about, you know, you moving from Scotland to Australia to the U.S. Um, are you bringing these bikes with you or did you start your collecting when you got here? And then how hard was it to collect all those bikes and what was the most difficult bike to get out of that whole collection? Did you have to like search high and low for a particular model, particular year? How was that? Man, yeah. And when I tell you the hardest bike to collect, you're going to laugh because people are like, seriously? Um, so it all started, uh, so 1995, I emigrated to Australia from Scotland. Two years after, 1997, my parents are moving house. So they're moving, they're sold out, they've sold their house, and all my stuff, like we all do, it's all under the, under the house. I mean, Midwest and everything, you've got cellars. And, so we've thrown everything in Scotland. I mean, our house was built in, I think it was 1786. So it was an older house, but it had this big cellar downstairs. And I mean, it looked like they would actually hold Shetland ponies in there. They had all these cubicles in this cellar downstairs that had been there for hundreds of years. So that's where, and I had my Star Wars collection under there as well, but that's another story. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I'm, I'm, you said Star Wars, man. I'm all in on that. I love it. Man, I had a crazy, stupid scene built underneath the house. Like all these, it was all on fishing, fishing line, you know, and all these spaceships underneath. I even made a video uh, back in 86 and I went, I had the do, 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 and I've got this big camcorder like this size, uh, borrowed from my, my mum, obviously it wasn't mine. But um, anyway, my parents, all my stuff was under the house and I moved. Now, you guys know, and probably the listeners know, when you move, you're out. So with Enton's left, it gets dumped. My parents boxed up everything, my bikes, my plaster casts holding my leg together, crutches from the old hospital visits, Star Wars, uh, BMX, broken forks, frames, everything. They never threw one thing out. Boxed it all up, 14 crates full of shit, and just shipped it all to Australia in 97. So you can imagine, I haven't seen a lot of this stuff. I mean, I had my, I had my first 1988 Harrow Sport. I had my 89 Master and I had my 91 Master. All bikes, as they were, they all broke. I mean, Harrow's broke. <laughs> so uh, everything was shipped over there, and I was like, it was a time warp. That feeling I got in 97 is what I get still today when I ride a lineage in 2020. You know, yeah, I was just loving it, loving it as well. And that's what I got, and I wanted to share that feeling with everyone, never knowing in 97, 23 years later, and here I am as the brand manager for Harrow, creating all these lineage products. So that's where the collection started, Craig. It was 97. eBay had just started in 97, if uh, some of the listeners didn't, didn't know that. But uh, so I start, started digging around. I mean, I was finding like Bashgard Masters for like 180 bucks. Like, you can't get that now. <laughs> so if I, like my 89, I couldn't find a fork. I would have to buy a frame and fork just to get the fork and then not toss the frame, but I'd keep it and sell it off. Or sometimes I needed a bash guard plate. Again, I would have to buy a new frame and fork to get the plate, then sell off what I didn't need. And people don't, sadly, a lot of people don't get that today that are collecting because they only started collecting 10, maybe even 15 years ago. But when I started my collection in 97, when I started to restore my first three harrows, then it had that snowball ripple effect that I didn't just want to put them together. I needed to then get them era correct. And then I started seeing other things. I was like, wow, look, there's a brand new 1985 Harrow Master in green frame and forks for sale. It was $500. I'm buying that. That was in the box. So then it just went 
on and on and on. And my wife at the time thought I was crazy. Uh, but it just, yeah, I mean, it went on so much so that, uh, yeah, I ended up with 128 Harrow bikes. And you were asking where I stored them. Well, back in Australia, I mean, I did have a nice house and I had them all on display. Then I had to box them all up because I went through a divorce, but I kept my bikes. She got the house, I got the bikes. Um, biggest mistake, actually. <laughs> I'd have been better to keep that house. <laughs> it was like 850 grand, that house. So, um, yeah, I'd have been better to keep the house. But anyway, the ex-wife and daughter got that, so that's all good. So, um, all the way through, you also asked, what was my hardest bike to build? You'd think it'd be like the 82 with the graphite ones. I mean, I paid $2,800 for a set of graphite ones. Oof. 2800 I mean... People, yeah, you'll, you'll see people paying up to four grand for a set of those, the original 82s. So, but the question, the hardest bike to complete was a 2007 Nyquist Pro. Mm. What? Seriously. Yeah. The Nyquist because has, Pro. Because it has 40 spoke hub and rims. That was the hardest thing to get. 40 spoke hub and rims. The premium hubs... And the, God, a listener's going to kill me now. I'm trying to think if it was a Rhea or Alex Rim. I think it was Alex. I think it was Alex, uh, 40 hole. But it was painful. Painful to, something like that. You wouldn't think it'd be so hard, but it was, it was so difficult to find 40 hole hubs. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine. Off, of course, as well. It needed to be new. I don't right. like using used parts. <laughs> So, you know, during this whole time, John, you have over, a, well, not the whole time, but at the end of all this, you've got over 120 Haro bikes and you're, yeah. and you're going through all the processes of finding parts, error correct, um, finding the bikes and all that that goes with it, right? Yeah. What are, you, what are you doing for work at this time, man? Because, you know, this stuff isn't cheap. Were you, were you living in a tent somewhere under a freeway? I mean, what, what's going on here? How, how does a guy get 128 bikes? Yeah, um, so I've, I've been in BMX 38 years. I've never stopped BMX. I mean, I'm actually going to do, I'm working on trying to put photographs of every single year of me riding. I haven't got footage, but I've got photos. So um, I started working in the industry in 94, working in a bike shop. People always ask, how do you become the brand manager? So I started in a bike shop. Went from a bike shop working in the wholesalers in Australia and absolutely loved it. You know, I was only, I was a salesman. Um, on, on the phones. And it was actually my first job in the industry without being in a bike shop was working for the distributor of Harrow in Australia. So that was in 2000. So at that time I was actually riding for Schwinn Australia. And then I got off of this job and the job was like, well, we'll flow you bikes to still ride and work for us. So I started working as uh, internal sales. So that was 20 years ago, but I was always into product development. I was always saying, but this breaks, I, like we all did when we rode the bikes. This breaks, how do we fix it? You know, the bars would bend. Well, we would take our stripped axles and hammer them into the, the bar and like bend it back up and straighten it all. And, you know, I've still got a set of knee saver bars that are fully re-welded and it's all make horrible welding and shit. But again, <laughs> these are memories. So fixing and getting into the industry, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to go, well, these things are breaking. Why are they breaking? Let's fix them. People like uh, G. Miron did that, you know, went out and started McNeil. Um, obviously, Matt Hoffman, you know, Rick Moliterno. I mean, Rick and Kurt and um, uh, Bill Ninsky. I mean, they were all at Harrow and they left Harrow because we need to buy, build Standard. The three of those guys left Harrow, started Standard Bike Company because they didn't, Harrow didn't listen. These bikes are breaking. This is what we should do. Now, nah. so they all left and created standard and it took years to break a standard if you were really right it you know uh, it wasn't a carpet queen it was that was a bike to be destroyed and standard would you would destroy it you might crack it if you did crack it they would give you a warranty you know i, I remember uh my 1980 i'm jumping all over the place guys i hope you don't mind no uh, keep going my 1989 harrow master bash guard bike and i'm grinding the bash guard in 89 and I don't know if you remember, but the bash guard itself was held on with bidden cage mounts. That's bottle cages. Those tiny little 2.5 mil threaded bottle cage holder 
is support, supporting this bash guard that you're grinding. So I ripped it off and shiners in the UK who had shitloads of product in the mid nineties and late nineties and dumped it all. That's why I got that uh, green master in the box because they had thousands of products. So phone shiners and I said, look, this bash guard ripped out. Oh, that's only there for stone chips. Flicking up stone chips. I'm like, have you seen the latest Harrow ad? Um, Leo, I don't know if it was Leo Chen. There was someone, um, Asian guy was grinding the bash guard. Was it Leo? I don't, Isaac, do you know that, who it was? But I, I know what you're talking about. I, I, uh, I know the picture, yeah. Yeah, that first picture, and again, it's crazy, but I do have that bash guard plate because it was never produced. So that plate's in my office. I've got that plate. I could, I could have had everything here showing you all these uh, little trinkets. But uh, so, um, yeah, I'm going off all over the place here, guys. But uh, yeah, I do that when I'm drinking whiskey. <laughs> as you should, as you should, as you should. I'm, I'm going to show you my, my one and only trinket from my old Flatland days. And this is me when I was four. Uh, this was... I was 12. I was 12 years old. And this was my first, my first Haro. And it's the Green Master. That's the Green Master. Yep. That's the and, frame and fork I got in a box. Yep. It's, it's a Green Master with some flight cranks and some purple tufts and some yep. pink tires uh, and some, uh, oh, they were the purple GT bars. Yep. And a, I believe I got a, it's the mallet, the GT mallet stem. Yep. That was my, or no, that's a tough neck. I'm sorry, I looked at it wrong. It's a tough neck stem. Um, okay. But that was that was my my entrance into into uh, to flatland, and and from that point on, man, my next that was my first what I call like my first freestyle bike because even at that point, if you you either raced or you were a freestyler, and if you were a freestyler. Uh, you, 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 maybe you did flatland all day until you found a friend with a kick ramp. And then you did, then you were like, I'm Diz Hicks today and yeah. I'm going to go and do some kick ramp stuff. And then everybody had that one friend that had a little bit of money or was a little bit sketchy and they built a quarter pipe somewhere, you know? And so like, then you rode ramp. Um, but then my second bike was the, the mint green Joe Gratola bike, the, the Haro master, the mint green one. Yep. And again, dude, like the the you you touched on it and it really kind of hit me right in the right in the the soul when you were like you know when you you ride one of these bikes and you just know like yeah. you you just okay i am home and craig and i have kind of talked about this too in in former podcasts about you know if if you're a bmxer and i mean just mean you ride a 20 inch bike you ride a bike with this bmx geometry mm -hmm. um you know, it's either because like you're either like a beach cruiser kid, you were a 10 speed kid or you were, you know, a freestyle or BMXer. Um, yeah. You know, when you look back at, at those 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 first moments of riding a bike, um, what's it like now being who you are now? Like, do, could you even imagine like I the first time you wrote a Haro that like you're going to be sitting here talking to like these two old guys in being in charge of the Haro brand, what does that feel like? What is that? I, I just can't imagine. I, I literally cannot fathom what that's like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. Like I'm, get, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Um, the the one person that really got me into Haro was a guy called Scott Carroll. So um, if you've seen, I mean, Scott in his age group won the Worlds in 1988. Um, I mean, him and Carlo Griggs were like this, you know, and even Jamie and Simon will tell you, like, they could never go above what Scott was doing. Um, so he was the one, the first guy to introduce me. And <clears throat> I'm still friends. Scott sadly passed away in the late 90s, in 98. Um, I mean, he took his own life, which sucks. And, uh, you know, I miss him every day. I'm still friends with his mum. And his mom actually said to me a couple of years ago, she goes, I feel like Scott's living through you because this is something he would have loved to have done. What you're doing, John, I feel like Scott is still with us. I mean, <laughs> Scott, Scott gave me those. So when you're asking before about Swatch and stuff like that, Scott was the one that would always hook me up with stickers and watches and my Team Harrow jacket that I still have that's in the closet. 
I could have is, it, is it the denim one, the denim jacket? Yeah, the denim Shut jacket. Up. You have one of those? Yeah. <laughs> I've got the original that Scott gave me. And he, he gave me it because he got beaten up. Because the guys in my town, actually, this is Dundee. This is where I come from. So this is, this is our old view from my mom and dad's house. So, well, actually, it's up the hill from my mom and dad's house. But, um, yeah, the guys in, in Dundee thought it said Team Hard. Oh, you think you're hard, do you? So, Team yeah, hard. he was like, hey, John, you can have it. <laughs> Man, I remember when those came out, dude. Do you remember those, Craig? It's like an acid wash, like, denim. It's like Haro oh, did dude. these, like, Haro did these, like, uh, uh, like upscale, like, apparel. And, and that was one of the, I remember seeing the, the advertisement for it. I didn't know anybody that ever owned one. That's the, that's the funny part. I've only seen it in magazines. Well, it's crazy because um, I've got this one and Eben Krakow just called me yesterday and he's, he found a brand new one and he bought it for me and he's sending it to me. A brand new, never worn. So it's black, whereas mine's more, almost charcoal because it's been worn so much. But do you guys want to see it? Yes, I want oh, to yeah. see it. I was, I was it. hoping you would. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> This is incredible. I, I am absolutely uh, just blown away right now. This is crazy. This is like the greatest uh, like walk down memory lane for Isaac right now. No, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. That is so crazy. And if you're just listening on the podcast, um, John has a stack of original OG Swatch stickers. And if you grew up in the 80s, um, Swatch Watch was like the, I think, man, it was like the quintessential, everyone had to have a Swatch. I remember I got one for my birthday and I felt like I was the shit. Um, did, you have, did you have Swatches, Craig? Did you wear those big? Oh yeah, you? I wore a ton of them. Um, my Swatches usually had the, uh, the Swatch Guard, the, the band that goes over the, the glass. Um, I, I had maybe three or four <laughs> Swatches and uh, now I'm trying to buy more like, like John's doing. But uh, yeah, Swatches were the thing right oh could, yeah yeah the crazier the better the wilder design the better i remember we used to trade them at school with like other kids so like you'd maybe get one and then you'd be tired of looking at it and so you trade it for somebody else and then the swatch guards that you're talking about that really didn't guard anything it was it was no, like, yeah it didn't guard it shit it was a glorified <laughs> rubber band that made it, it, would, it would land on it and it would just break off straight away right. yeah right crack or snap or just ping off Exactly. Yeah, it did nothing. It did nothing but made it so you couldn't read the time actually on your watch. And yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, John, go ahead. No. So I'm actually moving right now. I just, I sold my Harrow collection and bought a house, but anyway, that's, that's another part of the story. Um, but I packed most of my stuff. The only thing I found was I found this one. Oh this man. This is brand yeah. new as well. Brand new, never worn. I've been buying all my original clothing again. I've still got my original jacket. But this was on eBay for 285 bucks. And I was like, God damn, I mean, it's brand new, never worn. So I bought the jacket and I bought a pair of pants. You, do you know what's fun is uh, if you've seen, if you like to talk about how much I love Vision Streetwear, if you've seen our logo. Yes, yep, I saw that. I mean, I'm all like my two biggest brands. I'm just gonna geek out for a second. My biggest brands when I was growing up Vision Streetwear, obviously, like everybody else, yeah. uh, and Life's a Beach. And Life's yeah. a Beach, you can't find anymore because it kind of took that weird turn into MMA and the yeah. whole Bad Boy Club thing. And then, and then uh, now I'm, I've seen, okay, so I'm following them on Instagram, waiting for them to try and like, I don't like, kind of re, rebrand themselves and figure out what they're doing uh, yeah. because they haven't really started embracing their roots yet. Same with Vision Streetwear. Like I've seen like there's an Instagram, but I haven't. I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna you know try and make a comeback. I really hope they do, but yeah, craziness. Man, you know, yeah, I love that. I, I had it, it was. I've got a weird story about Vision Streetwear as well. Like, <clears throat> is this PG or is this eighteen plus? This is us. This is us just chopping it up, man. You say what you want, buddy. So, I wouldn't have sex unless I was wearing something Vision Streetwear. My man. <laughs> My man, I, mean, I had to be. I had to be the vision watch. I had to be my socks, or I would be naked and have a, my my beret, my <laughs> the, the like crack a headband, beret. like a headband and a fanny pack. 
Oh, oh yeah, exactly. I'd, have, I'd have to give something on, even if it was one sock. I mean, since we're talking about sex, have you ever tried to have sex through a Skyway grabber seat? Yeah, I did. <laughs> that, oh, that is, yeah. I, I don't even know what's, I, like, Hold I would on, say. I'm adding, on, to my, yeah. I'm adding to my bucket list right now. Hold on. <laughs> I, I told Ken Coster this, and Ken's like, because I was restoring, I'm now restoring bikes that meant so much to me, not stock, but the way I had it, with whatever we could afford at the time, you know, the Toyoga one piece crank or whatever. And I was telling Ken Coster, I said, look, I'm trying to restore the bike on the front cover of my book, but I had a Skyway grabber. Again, I got that from Scott Carroll. Like most things I always got from Scott. And I told him the story about the seat and he goes, I need to find you one of these. Like, and they, those seats go for 350, 400 bucks. And Ken found me one and just sent it to me as Ken Coster does. I mean, amazing. Like, would never charge me for Skyway or nothing. I'm like, dude, seriously, like, yeah, uh, absolutely brilliant. So um, always had to wear something Vision Street wear. It was just a weird thing. But at one point, I think I had everything from the shoes, the socks, the pants, the underwear, um, the fanny pack. I never had a belt because they always had that drawstring, you know, so I never had a belt. The T-shirt, the watch the hat and the sunglasses. It was just like, what else could you have on that wasn't vision? I was like, people thought I was a, yeah, whatever they thought. <laughs> everybody had, everybody had it though. I, ha I remember, I'll never forget, I had a, uh, it was the black and white crackle hip pack and that had my, that had my, all my tools in it, went with me everywhere. Yep. I had, I had that one, it was like a zebra almost. Yes, zebra. exactly. Yeah, it looked yep, like it was I had, just, that, uh, I had that one. There was that, um, my best friend Lee had the, uh, had the red, the red and black crackled pattern beret. Yep. And then what else did I have? I had the uh, the vision, I had the matching button up shirt that had yep. vision just all the way down the side. Just down one side. Yep. Yeah, and then, I've, got, I've got that. It's packed away, but I have that one still, yeah. And I had the pants. I remember I had the pants, but then, uh, yeah, I mean, if, dude, if you ever find some, some like big size of those, like extra large, and it's not gonna fit you, yeah. Let, your, let your boy know because I want to get a pair of those pants like so bad. They don't, yeah, he's talking. He's, he's talking about me. Let I'm, I'm uh -huh. right there. Yeah, let me know. I mean, if I knew, <laughs> I would have because I, I did. I bought some new pants. I bought some new shoes, and I bought. And Steve Caballero actually gave me a pair of Vision socks recently. Like he gave me a pair of Vision socks. He's like, I know you like Vision. I'm like, how do you remember I like Vision? So that was pretty crazy. But Craig, there was something else as well. You asked and I didn't answer was how did you afford all this? going on and I got thrown out of school at 15. I started working at 14. So I saved up for my first harrow and everything. Like I was so determined to be self-sufficient. So all the way through, I've never owned, I've never paid interest on a credit card and I've always owned everything. So I've saved up. Like my first Star Wars figure, I used to get a pound of an allowance, one pound. But a Star Wars figure was a pound 50. So I would save for two weeks and I'd have two pounds, I would buy one figure and leave my, my 50 pence. And then I would wait for the next week, then I could buy another figure. And it was like, I wouldn't buy treats or anything. I just, I was so focused at such an early age because my previous life, I'd had nothing. I'd never had a gift. I, I never owned anything. I mean, I would wear my school clothes after school and on weekends because I never had anything to wear. So um, that went on at a very early stage getting into work uh, to buy my bikes. And that's how it went on for the rest of my life. Just determined to work my ass off and always own what, and work for it to, to own it. I was never given it. Yeah, and so, I mean, that's incredible too, because you, you know, at some point that work ethic followed you throughout life. Um, you've got such an amazing collection of bikes. Tell us a little bit about when you decided that you were gonna sell these bikes because that was pretty monumental it was on bmx museum it was everywhere that john bulchins is selling his collection and i think you know people were picking their jaws up off the floor they just couldn't believe it that the most you know extensive collection of harrow bikes was about to hit the uh the marketplace yeah. um how long did it take to get to to uh offload all those and then you mentioned it a little bit before after you sold the bikes what what was your big purchase after that? Yeah, so um, a lot of people say, why did you do it? Why did you sell them? Uh, and the funny, not a funny thing, but 
uh, no one will remember this but me. And this is my humor. I posted my collection on April Fool's Day, but uh. at 12 o'clock. So it's a weird thing. Maybe in the UK, I don't know if it's in, in the US, but in the UK, April Fool's Day, only, you can only play the prank until lunchtime, until 12 o'clock. So I posted my bikes at 12.01. But a lot of people are like, nah, he's not doing it. It's April Fool's, no way. He's not selling that collection. I mean, 21 years of my life to collect all this. So I collected these because I wanted to create the history of Harrow. I wanted a timeline of Harrow's existence. But I didn't do race, I only did freestyle. I didn't do mountain bike. I mean, geez, it cost me 350 grand to collect 128 bikes. I can't do race and mountain bike. And yeah, <laughs> I saw the face. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I offered the timeline to the shareholders of Harrow. I said, look, this is the entire timeline of your history. Specialized, Trek, Cannondale. I mean, giant. No one has a timeline of their history. They've got snippets and pieces. GT, no one. They've got pieces of history. This is your entire history in one lump sum. And all I'm asking, not my labor, I'm asking for what I paid. Um, when I offered, I didn't build a collection to sell it. I built the collection to build a house around it and build this timeline. Um, but then I realized, because I had, when you were also talking about storage, I did build a 30 bike museum at Harrow. You, you may have seen it. I had an 80s wall. I had my boombox on there. I had clothing. And so 80s, you walked around it was the 90s. So went to pretty much, you know, around from the bash guards into sort of the Blamos and the ultras and everything, then back to the masters. Then it went into the Dave Miras and the Ryan Nyquist. So it was a 30 bike display. And so that was already there. And I was like, well, I'm showing this love. I wanted people to come to work at Harrow and work through, walk through the history of Harrow. Like feel where we've come. I mean, we're one of the originators of freestyle. So feel it when you walk into this building. When I got to Harrow, it was an office. And that was it. There was no memorabilia. There was no posters of the, or legends of the 80s. Um, so creating all that, I wanted to create almost a, it wasn't just a museum, it was a home. It was know your roots. Uh, and I wanted the salespeople who haven't come from BMX to know where we came from. So anyway, um, I thought, look, I've got all this, I've got all these bikes, but I'm paying rent. Like I finished the collection. I set myself a goal to build the complete history of Harrow. So I did, I set myself a goal. I did it. Now it's, it's, it'd be great if someone else could actually enjoy it. So that's why I put it up for sale. It was, the shareholders weren't interested. They were like, nah. I said, well, do you want the, the oldest original? I've got this original, unrestored. Everything on it was 95% perfect, but it was used. But it was my 1982. And I mean, so they weren't interested. So I actually, I gave that away for a $10,000 car, that bike. And I gave it to a, an ex-girlfriend's daughter who I thought, may have been my daughter. It's in my book, actually. I talk about I may have another daughter out there. So I flew to Australia. Uh, Nick D.W., his name is, he's got some crazy harrows from 82 and 83. It's all he collects, American made. Um, he's got probably 14, 15 sets of graphite tufts. So this is me scrambling for one set. He's got like 14 or 15 sets. Um, he said he wanted the bike and he's a car dealer. He's got a dealership and stuff. So I swapped him the bike for the car. And I gave this car away to, to this young girl in need. I mean, I didn't know if she was my daughter or not. We were going to do the DNA test and everything else. And the satellite came back negative, but at least I've taken a stand for another human being. Like this young girl, um, sadly as well, just lost her mum last year to suicide. And that was my ex-girlfriend for a year and a half. So I, was, I could probably write another book after. Um, but my, the end of the, 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 basically my story is, the, the shareholders weren't interested and I thought I'm renting and I'm 48 years old or 46 at the time. Um, I could buy a house. Like I could put a good deposit on a house. So I started selling them. And now this has been two years and two months, two years and three months. And I have five bikes left to sell. Wow. Um, I mean, that's incredible. So 
And I kept my favourites though. People are like, oh, but what about? I'm like, no, no, no. So no. I have a brand new, I have a NOS. So I have my original 88 Sport and I have a NOS complete bike 88 Sport in the box. I have an 89, my original 89 Chrome, and I have a NOS 89 frame and fork that I've built up with all NOS parts. So it's got NOS Fusion cranks on it, it's got NOS uh, Super Pros, NOS ta uh, HBF tires. So that's the bikes I'm not letting go of. I'm keeping my personal ones and I'm keeping the, the NOS uh, of my originals. And then I've collected all my lineage bikes. So I'm collecting every serial number one of every lineage bike I bring out. And, and that was because of Mike Dominguez. <laughs> because when I did his <laughs> bike, I offered him number one. I was like, you're Mike Dominguez. Can I give you number one? And that was in 2014. He's like, damn, John, you did all this work. You have number one, I'll take number two. I'm like, so that started my collection of lineage bikes. So I'm collecting the history of my history at Harrow whilst I'm here. Hopefully I'm here for a while. Um, but yeah, that's where my collection is now. I've got five bikes left to sell. I've kept my personal bikes, the ones that mean something to me, and the lineage series. That's what, that's, this is my time. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a picture of you. It was in your Instagram post, and you had this big shit-eating grin on your face because you were standing in front of your new house with, uh, with this smile saying, yeah, I, I just bought my first new house or whatever, and, and you know, this was- South for, America, for yeah. Bikes, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, it is, it's like, and someone actually commented BMX pays because that was Bob's number plate. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't build my bikes to sell them. Um, but then when I realized that shareholders weren't interested, I knew I've got 128 bikes and 100 of them were in boxes. I mean, that's sacrilege. Like, enjoy, let the bikes breathe. I have so many people that have bought my bikes and they're like, they're on display now and, and all over the world. Yes, it would be great to keep that timeline together. And it will not... I hope it's re replicated again one day, but it's going to be tough to replicate because no one's that insane. Not many people are that insane to have every single pro model of every single year. But now people can enjoy my, my hard work that I spent three years on most bikes uh, putting together. So now I can smile because I still have people who will comment and go, your bike's in pride position in my house. And it means something that I, I put it together, which, which, yeah, it gets me. <laughs> Most definitely. And, and you were talking about the history. Um, you know, you mentioned your book. You mentioned your, your upbringing and stuff. Um, I read your book last year, and it's Ride BMX Glory Against All the Odds by John Bolchins. And uh, Chris Sweeney co-wrote that with you, correct? Yeah. Um, if you guys haven't read this book, um, you need to. You need to. You need to order it. Go to Amazon or wherever you buy your books at and, and get this book. It is such an amazing story from start to finish. And John's touched on it a little bit. Um, that actually ended up, so the book's out and then you get some contact and, and you make, you know, you're talking to a producer or you run into a producer um, kind of on the, on the fly, right? I mean, it wasn't planned. It was kind of like a conversation and you're telling this guy your story and, and what does he say to you and how does this whole book how do you get into the book, first of all? And then how does that turn itself into now you're on the set of a Hollywood movie telling your life story? Well, would you believe the Hollywood movie came first before the book? Which is I didn't know that. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. So um, basically, I was doing the 2014 Dominguez bike. And this guy phones up from, from Warner Brothers. And he's like, Yo, John, this is Ali Afshar from Warner Brothers. I'm the producer up in Hollywood. And I see you got this Mike Dominguez bike. Can I get it from you or do I need to go retail? I'm like, oh, man. All right, whatever, dude. I said, I'll, I'll put you onto the sales department. And I just, as we say in Australia, you pan them off, you know, just pan them off. Deal with the sales department. They'll look after you. So he bought the bike from us. 12 months later, he then phones up. Yo, John, what happened? You've got the Brian Blyther FST? Why didn't you tell me? And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, I told the world. Sorry I didn't call you. And he's like, dude, I'm up in Hollywood right now. I could be down there in two hours. 
can I buy the bike from you? I'll come down and take you out to lunch. And I'm like, all right, dude, whatever. Like, I mean, I'm going to have a lunch break anyway, so come down. So he drove down. He drove down in his, um, oh, my God, what was that? It was like a Charger, Challenger. It was, it was the crazy, it was the fastest street legal car at the time. What was that? Hellcat. So he drove down in the Hellcat and he come down and, and I've got my Camaro and everything. And so anyway, he drove up and he's a professional racing car driver as well. So he brings me all these like Hot Wheels cars and DVDs of all the movies he'd made and everything. Like came here with a box set, like gave me this shit. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then we went out to lunch. And we were just down uh, having a sandwich. And he's like, so John, tell me, how did you get into BMX? So I said, well, he's about to take a bite from his sandwich. <laughs> well, at the, age of, at the age of three years old, my dad threw me in a fire to kill me. And at the age of five, I was homeless, living in the streets of Glasgow in Scotland. And at seven years old, well, my dad regularly would beat up my mum. If he wasn't beating me up or my brother up, he would beat up my mum severely. And I ran in with a kitchen knife to kill him. Uh, my dad knocked me out before I stabbed him. And next I remember is I'm in school. So it's, it's now in school, 24th of December, 1979, 12.30. And I'm having sponge cake and custard. And social services and the police come in and take me away. And he's like, holy shit. And I went, yeah, well, I was in juvie for three years and they had this foster program. Well. Foster parents come in to meet me. Mum's white and my dad's black, and I'm a racist. And he's like, God damn, I'm gonna make your movie. And I'm like, whatever, dude. And then I told him, I said, they took me to see ET, I saw BMX, and my whole life is now. I mean, 38 years after seeing ET, and I still feel like that little kid, like we all do when we get on that bike. You're just that little kid, you know. I don't want to grow up. I'll never grow up, you know. I I want to be relatable to those kids and I want to be relatable to those consumers. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how the whole movie deal came about from designing the, the Dominguez bike to the Blyther bike to then 18 months later, we're on in NorCal um, filming a movie. And I mean, I had, mate, you wouldn't believe like Hugo Gonzalez came out, um, Oscar Gonzalez, um, you know, I had Mike D as a judge. Um, Brian Blyther, Ron Wilkerson, and Matt Hoffman, Xavier Mendez, and then Mike Escamilla was actually the, the MC. So I was like, and then I, this is a modern day movie, okay? So I didn't want it to be old school. I didn't want it to be set in Scotland because it rains eight days out of seven. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we decided to make it in California because you're almost guaranteed that it's going to be great weather. And uh, I wanted to have my heroes as the judges, you know, like, my heroes are my freaking closest friends now. I mean, Pete Augustine, Dave Volker. Volker's always like, oh, I thought I was your hero. Why am I not a judge? And I went, because you were dino. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Dave. Sorry, you were Dave. Dino. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, to have them there. And then I phoned up um, Dennis Anderson, Chad Curley, Chase Hawk, uh, Chris Fox, Larry Edgar, like all the, um, the most amazing riders today phoned them up and said, hey, do you want to be a part of this? I mean, I'll pay you. Like, well, SAG pays $650 a day. Do you want to come and play BMX? <laughs> <laughs> so flew everyone up to, um, uh, we filmed in Napa at the Napa Skate Park. Flew everyone up there. Um, they were flights, accommodation, and they were all paid to be in this movie. So it's, I wanted it to be relatable today. I didn't want it to be back in the day when, I mean, Racism has been around for, God, I mean, hundreds of years. And right now what's happening, uh, all I'm hearing right now is, John, your movie is relevant today. I mean, goosebumps right now. Jay Miron sent me a message last night. And Jay's like, you're on, you're on Donald Trump's, uh, uh, what was it? I'll have to find my phone. But he was basically like, you're, you're on his list. Like, if he sees this film, you're on his list, like you're on his top 10 list uh, because we talk, on, we talk about, yeah, the racist aspect. I mean, I've got, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little bit of a swastika in there. When I was like six years old, my childhood gang tried to give me a swastika in my ear. And in the movie, they actually cut his neck with a swastika. 
I mean, we talk, it is like American History X with BMX. So it's quite dark at the beginning. Um, you know, Craig, you've read the book, you know, it's, I don't hold back. Um, but this is PG-13, whereas the book is R-rated. So, yeah, um, we, we just want to show that from this film that leave the past in the past. You know, we all went through shit. We all went through shit, good or bad. You can't change it. But being here, living in the moment, talking to you guys, drinking my scotch, like I'm living in Southern California, bitches. Like, <laughs> I would never have thought that this would be possible. Being the global brand manager of Harrow, still riding a BMX bike almost at 50, um, and to inspire one human being a day, like that's all I want to do. I want to be remembered for inspiring someone, not for being a dick that I used to be when I was younger. <laughs> so. That's a long answer to you. No, and it's a great answer because um, that was one of the things, you know, the, the book, just to keep going with it a little bit more, um, it was a page turner. There was so many things going on from, from the first page. I mean, it was really um, an incredible story of triumph, of overcoming, uh, like the book says, against all odds, right? Overcoming all the odds. So John, it was just like, I, I read it like four times and I actually passed the book on to someone else because I'm like, you have to read this. Now I know that doesn't do anything for your book sales. No, It's better if someone buys that. it, but no, I'm like, you need to read this. You know, I gave it to another BMXer and I'm like, read this story, man. This is, this goes beyond just, it's not, it's not a, a, a fictional book. This is a, a true life story. It's incredible. And so, you know, I commend you for, from where you came from and then now coming up through, you know, everything that you did and, and, of course, sitting there in the chair of the global brand manager of Haro Bikes, after being such a big fan of the company, it's like everybody's dream who has a dream about, you know, where they're going to end up in life. But you couldn't have written it. You couldn't have scripted it. No. And, and what happens at the end? It's written and it's scripted and it's in a movie. Um, where, where is that now? Is, is, have they, have, do they have plans for release? I know you had a... Uh, you had a filming, uh, a screening up in Napa at the uh, Napa Film Film Festival, and that yep. went pretty well. Big turnout. Everyone's yeah, we there. Sold out. We're the only screening sold out, actually. We've won awards at Napa Valley Film Festival, Boston Film Festival, um, Newport Beach Film Festival. I mean, it's been incredible. Uh, yesterday, I had a Zoom meeting with Chris Bridges, uh, Ludacris. Um, that's his real name, Chris Bridges. Uh, his manager... Roadside Attractions, our, our uh, distribution company. Um, people don't realize how hard it is to get a distributor for your film. 98% of Hollywood movies are going straight online now because it's so hard to get a distributor. It took us three years to get a distributor. So where's the movie now? Well, it was due to be released July 31st. Then COVID hit and people were scared to go to the cinemas. Um, we had a Zoom meeting yesterday with everyone, including Forrest Lucas' son. So Lucas Oil paid for the film to be made. Lucas Oil. Uh, Forrest Lucas heard my story, read the script, and had his own script about his life. And his life is amazing as well, Forrest Lucas, how he became a billionaire from nothing. Uh, he made his fortune. And uh, he chose my script over his own. I was like, wow, that was incredible. So where is it now? Well, it looks, sadly, it looks like it's going to be dropped online and I hate that. We had booked 650 cinemas, were locked in. Uh, the number one cinemas across the country were locked in for July 31st. Um, they're saying cinemas are going to open July 1st. Uh, Tenant is, a, I don't know if you guys have heard of Tenant, but that is going to be massive. That was a $205 million budget. Um, Mulan from Disney. So Tenant comes out on the, what is that? I'm going to work back. So we're meant to come out on the 31st. Mulan from Disney was going to come out on the 24th. And then 17th, I guess that was going to be Tenant. Um, Tenant is still in, Mulan is still in, and sadly, it looks like we're, we're pulling out. We're not going to risk it. And we're going to put it online. And I'm like, why are we putting it online? It's the middle of summer. We're not going to be indoors anymore. If you're going to put it online, you should have put it online three months ago. You're going to be out at the cinema. If you, I'm not saying if you're educated, if you're a, 
it'd be a mix. Like, I believe we're all the same, that we think the same, that um, you, you believe what you see, not what you read. And 98% of the deaths of COVID-19 had underlining symptoms. Um, you're healthy, you're fit, you're well. I don't want to go near my parents. I don't want to put them in that situation. They're 76 years old. I mean, they've been stranded on that, that uh, FaceTime message, that phone call. They're stranded in Perth, Australia right now. They've been there for four months because they weren't allowed to fly. Like flights were canceled. I don't want to put anyone in jeopardy, but my friends and my young ones that are fit and able, like we will build their immune system and we will kick the sack. It will kick COVID's ass. I mean, we're strong enough. Yeah. It's not going to kill healthy people. If you're a smoker, yes, you may be, you may have to be careful. If you have underlining symptoms, you know, Matt actually was abusing me online yesterday because I spoke up and I said, let's open up the country. We need to build this country back. We need to be powerful as we are. You know, I'm not an American. I have a green card, but I feel like I'm an American. I live here and I, I pay my taxes. I, I want to build this country up again. Like we were the most powerful country in the world. So right now we're split. And I believe this movie will bring a lot of people together and actually get you to think for yourself that you're the boss of you. No one else can decide what you want to do, but you. Um, and that's what you get from BMX. Like you are an individual, but it is a brotherhood. And we got each other's backs. Even if you didn't know someone and they were attacked at the skate park and they're on a bike, you'll be over there being there for them and protecting them or breaking up the fight or whatever. It's like, that's what you get from the sport. You know, you want, you want your friends to, to do well. And my friends are so proud of me for what I've done. And so many of my friends are in the industry, like Rick Moliterno, Ronnie Bonner, Grant Smith owns BSD, like uh, Clint Miller with Colony and stuff. And they're all happy for us. And that's what you get from BMX. So that's what I want from this movie, that I really want the cinema release. I'm, I'm struggling. Oh, we need this another $3 million for marketing. And uh, I'm like, I won't even buy my house. I'll give you all the money from my bike collection. I'm in escrow right now. I'll pull the fucking pin and I'll give you all my money. I believe in this movie so much. Not that it's about me. It's about humanity. It's about struggle. It's about determination. It's about racism, domestic violence. It's about everything we're touching on right now in this moment. I believe in it so much that I'm willing to throw my house at it because I know I won't lose my house. And I said that, and I'm just hoping that we're gonna find out in the next 10 days to 14 days, if we're gonna keep that slot of July 31st, because I mean, I'll, I'll ask you guys, both of you, would you go to the cinema on July 31st? Oh, absolutely. I'd be there in a heartbeat. I, I actually wanted to, I thought you were gonna do the release up in Petaluma. And I think I was bugging you a bit about it, but I was like, yeah, I'll be there, dude. But of course, I mean, that's a great point. Um, we need this. Uh, we need to hear that rise out of um, of struggle and that rise from being uh, kept pinned down and, and coming up and and just having that victory. We we as a country, we as a as a society at, as a whole, we need that. You know, and I'd definitely be there. Um, not just because of BMX. The BMX part's awesome. Of, of course, yeah. I love that. The story is incredible, and it just shows you that with determination and with um, perseverance and knowing that things will get better, that we can overcome uh, anything that's, that's put in front of us or that knocks us down, that the best thing to do is to get back up and, and to try to, uh, to, to be better and to want better things and to struggle for that because they can be obtained. Um, yeah. I, Isaac, what are, what are your thoughts? I mean, are you going to this movie or what? I, I'm going to be the unpopular opinion here. Um, but that's just because I love John. I'm gonna tell you like exactly, you know, I'm not gonna kind of sugarcoat it, but yep. um, for me, I, I would not, I am not ready to go out into like a, a, like a cinema yet. Um, yep. But I will tell you like, I 100% I support whatever you do because of the, see the, the common thing that, that you've talked about for the last hour, every story that you've told, there's a, there's a it's, it's the human, it's the human aspect of BMX and, and how all of our lives tie together. Um, listening to us talk, 
um, you know, you grew up with, with in a different country even than, than, you know, I did, but we all have these, these shared experiences and we all like, I see that boom box behind you and that sticker that you have, the club homeboy sticker, the, the, I can see it from here, the orange club homeboy sticker. Yeah. Instantly. And, and I always tell people, like, if I see a brand, like if I saw you walking down the street with that vision streetwear jacket, um, not only would I pull over. I would pull over and be like, brother, you don't know me, but you know me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's the same way if I see somebody riding like one of your bikes, if I see, if I'm riding outside and I see someone on a, on a, either it's a, an eighties bike or a lineage bike. If I see someone like I'm in the big bike, I love big bikes. That's like, that's where I feel the most comfortable again. I felt like I was, I was, uh, I was, I was orphaned by the BMX community because I'm not comfortable on a 20 inch bike. I bought a few of them and I just didn't feel comfortable until I found a big bike. And yep. so, you know, what got me back into this was I was, I, I randomly looked on because I still like to look at old BMX bikes. I was like, it's beyond me. I can't do it. And I was on planet BMX. Cause I just like to see what they have because you know, they, they seem to have like a lot of the older bikes, the skyways and, and you know, things like that. And I saw randomly on the front of their site, like, Haro DMC 26. And I was like, the, I remember telling my wife, you know, like, babe, this is what you should get me for Christmas. This is because she was like, what, what do you want for Christmas? I'm like, I don't know. I'm a grown ass man. I don't know what I want for Christmas, you know, like a hug, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, and so I saw that and I was like, babe, this is what I want. And then uh, I, you know, I went and, and I went over to my mom's house and found that picture um, that I showed you of me doing like the, 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 uh, you know, the bar, what, I forget, I even oh, forget what we call it. The gut lever, yeah, yeah. And so, so you know, like, I was like, babe, this was the first bike I ever got, and, and they're making it again. Like, but now it's going to, it's a size that'll fit me. Yeah. Um, and so, like, for me, the human aspect of everything you told, um, so even though I'm not ready to go back out, and, and I don't necessarily, like, I'm, I'm the other, like you said, we're divided. I'm the other side of the argument. I also have a, I like, I have a high risk. My, one of my sons, I have twins that are, that are uh, 12 years old. And so my twins, one of them has asthma really bad. So for me, I'm, for me, I'm like, this is a, this is a virus that's been out that we have effectively been studying for four months and we can't possibly know everything about it. You know, just, just a hundred years ago, we were leeching ourselves to try and cure diseases. Yeah. Like science hasn't come that far yet to know exactly the, what's going on with this. And, and I, I, I look at the numbers and I see the numbers starting to climb here in Arizona when, as we open back up. Um, I also have somebody like one of my kids, one of my kids, best friends, dads has passed away from this. And he yeah. was a very fit guy. He was, he, you know, he ran tough mutters. So I'm on the other side of this. Now, that being said, um, I would like when your movie comes out, I will absolutely support people going. If someone wants to go, I will say, absolutely. You should go see this. Yeah. Even even before I even knew your story, John, I would say go see it because it's got BMX. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm, we all have that rad story where we love rad. And if you talk to people, you're like, do you really love rad or you just love the intro? You know what I mean? Like, is the story that good or do we all just watch the credits? Um, yeah. So I would tell people go and go and support this if that's what you're comfortable with. But the minute it comes out, I can tell you I'm buying the shit out of your movie for the the forty or or sixty like. I remember I bought Breakin on on uh, VHS for you talked about saving money when you were a kid. I had to save up VHS tapes for all you kids out there that that may be listening to this. A VHS tape, if you want to own a movie in the '80s, cost you ninety four dollars, and I can tell you exactly how much it cost because that's how much I had to save up to get a VHS copy of Breakin, just to have that like you know Turbo and Ozone in my house when I wanted to watch them, you know, do that. So when yeah. your movie comes out. I will buy it on DVD. I will buy the digital copy. I will buy every single copy that you have just to support what you're doing because it's BMX and because like it's something that, that I am passionate about because I, I feel like, I think we all have this moment where BMX has saved us from something. Yeah. BMX kept me out of, like I grew up in, a, in an area in Stockton, California that, that has a lot of violence and there was a lot of gangs and I watched a lot of my friends go down that road. But because I was too busy doing freestyle, I, I was just like, that's not going to take me where I want to go if I go that route. So BMX in, essentially has saved my life. And, yeah. you know, your story and just 
the common the common human story that, that we've shared for the last hour is that you know if you focus on something that's positive that's challenging you you know like bmx is even if you're racing against somebody else you're racing against yourself because it's yeah. it's how can i be better you know and it's that repetitive like i'm gonna land this boomerang no matter what my shins are bleeding you know like mm -hmm. We can talk about your finger right now. Like, you know, I, I know, like I saw this on Facebook, right? You're like, is there anybody in San, like, is there anybody in San Diego that can fix this right now? You know what I mean? <laughs> yank it back and yank it back. And yeah, my friend JP is yanking it back. Right. Yeah. But even doctors couldn't get it back in, but oh surgeon my God. Did. it was good. Yeah. But, but I mean, it's just that challenge of, of overcoming something within yourself, whether it's a fear of something, whether it's a fear of, is this virus crazy or not? Everything yeah. that I've learned from BMX, I've applied to my adult life. So mm -hmm. I may not be in the theater. I do want you to launch this in theaters because I want someone to have, here's the thing. I saw, I, I can tell you exactly the smells of when I saw Rad because it smelled like gasoline because we snuck in in the back of Rick Delaney's uh, beat up Ford pickup truck. I was uh -huh. the one that drew the short straw and had to get in the bed of the truck. Um, and, and sneak into the Stockton Theater, uh, the Stockton, uh, uh, was it right next to Golfland? Uh, is Golfland still there, Craig? Is Golfland still there? I, I do. I'm not sure. I'm not. I, I don't You're know. You're always out there. Yeah. So there was, there was a, uh, right next to the Golfland water slides, there was a, a, a drive-in theater, and that's where I saw Rat. And so I want, I want those kids I to have that experience. Quick, I just have to tell you quickly, like, I got a shock then because I had deja vu. So when you were telling that... <laughs> back of the van and I, we've had this conversation before i get this all the time but yeah that was weird i had to tell you <laughs> that's that's fantastic but see that's the human that's the human side of all of this like yeah. your story my story craig's story everyone that's listening to this if if you like and i'll tie it back into haro like if you wrote a haro you wrote a gt you wrote a dino you we talk about the same things like you're talking about like oh i got this thing from peter gusson and my first question was like is he cool like was he yeah. cool? like what's he like because, you know, we grew up idolizing and looking at these guys, and these are the guys that you hang out with. Um, but I mean, man, I, told, I told Pete Augustine, I was doing a bike up, and I told Pete Augustine I needed this bad boy sticker, but I couldn't remember what it was. Pete Augustine drove up from La Mesa to Harrow and brought two boxes full of stickers and said, choose, what would you need? I mean, 30-plus-year-old stickers. That's Pete. Yeah. That's who he is. He will stand and be there for you. Like... I mean, I was intimidated by Peter Gustin watching like Agroman and everything else. And, but being such a close friend with Peter, like we talk two, three times a week. I mean, yeah, he'll be phoning me out. What are you doing, fucker? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love, yeah. That, he was the scariest guy. I mean, those like watching him do like a boob yeah. on, on like fire hydrants and stuff like that when, when everyone else is doing like a, you know, everyone else is doing a boomerang or something. And here's Pete just like, uh, uh, you know bunny hopping up a, a picnic table you know what i mean it's like yeah we were downtown because everything's closed we were downtown a couple of weeks ago pelican wall so he was riding this pelican wall back in the day and i mean it's, this is pure street i mean this is one of the first guys to actually hit street and so i'm i'm there like a month ago and i'm doing this fufanu on this rail and uh and pete's like dude this is the old pelican wall and he's showing me photographs of him like 32 years ago, right in this wall, but most of the wall's gone now, it's just a fence. So I'm foofanooing the fence that he was wall riding 32 years ago. And I'm like, it's surreal because again, I, I was taken back to 1988, 87, he's riding this. I mean, early days, it was him and, and Volker that, that took me into more street riding. When I saw them riding walls, like Volker going fakies, his fakies, I was just like, I need to do that. And, that was my inspiration. So, yeah. and to be friends with those two guys, like That's they take amazing. the I mean, every time, every time I'm I'm doing an event or whatever, uh, Volker will always be like, "Did they put a red carpet out for you, John?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's that dick that you gotta love him. But every time you'll see it, if you you see any of my posts, you'll be like, "Was there a red carpet? Was there a red carpet?" <laughs> like, <laughs> That's fantastic, dude. And, and if you that's your friends, your friends gotta take the piss out of you. If, if you guys you haven't, if you guys haven't seen it, John still rides hard. If you haven't seen John's uh, Abubaka or Fufanu or wall rides or whatever, you got to check out his page uh, on Instagram or, or get on YouTube. John, I got to give it to you, man. You still slay it, dude. You go out there and shred hard. There's no half-assing it with you. 
I no, mean, I'm sort of throwing down. Yeah, no, it's embarrassing. I mean, like, yeah, dislocated my finger the other day. I'm like, motherfucker. I mean, that was actually doing a wall ride in a plastic wave. So think it's a, it's a sculpture wave. And I'm doing this wall ride in there. And so most people get inside the wave. There's a fake surfboard. And you stand pretending you're surfing. Like, so people get photographs. It looks like they're surfing with all their clothes on. And so I'm like, no, nah, I want to wall ride this thing. So I've been wall riding it. And then last Saturday, I thought, no, I'm going to get really high. And my friend JP's in there with the GoPro. And I'm like, getting up there. And then I came straight down and I nose bonked the surfboard. I went over the bars, put my hands down. It wasn't even that fast, but all the plastic is all choppy like waves. So I put my finger down and it went, it went straight up. And I'm like, mother. <laughs> so I'm looking at it going, it wasn't even sore. I'm going, oh man, <clears throat> oh, shit, it's not moving. I tried it twice. JP tried it. And yeah, it's, it is what it is. I mean, people just laugh now when I hurt myself. I mean, I've broken my neck, I've broken my back. I've, fractured my skull too many times but smashed all my teeth out they're not scottish teeth they're all fake <laughs> they're looking pretty <laughs> they're pearly man <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you haven't seen john ride up a tree and come down fakey you know it's like he's up there like feeding the birds in the nest dude <laughs> he's so far up the tree you know it's it's still here's sick. here's my pro tip for anybody that that you know like if you if you google like if you google john bolchin's uh, pay attention to the, the timestamp on the video, not when it was uploaded, because it's really hard to tell if I'm watching you from like 80s, 90s, or just yesterday, which is, which is the, probably the highest compliment I could, I could possibly pay somebody because like, like Craig, the understatement of the year is like, John, you still shred, you know what I mean? Like to, to, to see what you're doing like now on these BMX bikes, um, is, is, it boggles your mind because he, like the gods of my day, like you don't see them riding anymore. You know, it's, it's like, you know, if they do, like, you'll see, you'll see him like riding down the beach or something like that. And you're like, dude, that's sick. Right. Um, and then there's John and John's, like you said, <laughs> here's John doing a wall ride. Here's John doing like the, the, you know, like grassroots, the, the grassroots grasso, like faking up a tree. Uh, straight out of 1986, 87. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's awkward to tell you because you're right there and you're like, man, I don't know what to say next. But dude, when, friends, when you're watching these videos, just pay attention to the, the timestamp of when the video was shot because uh, it's really gonna it's really gonna flip you out. And, and especially like us old guys, um, you know, you're a Rocky, bro. Like you're out there doing it still. Like it's just phenomenal. So, so hats off to you and thanks for, for continuing to shred. Oh dude, John, um, there's a clip mine. of John riding on the beach. John, that, that clip of you on the beach on the 26 inch bash, uh, bash guard. Yeah. He's coming off a cliff, dude. I mean, John's like sending it off this cliff, does a little tuck and roll and he's curled up and he's like, ah, you know, he's got blood I coming out. <laughs> and then there's a shot of him like doing some stuff on the on the on the beach head there, like some some rear hoppers and stuff. And it's like that, you know, John isn't letting up, man. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna stay rad for as long as his body holds up. And well, honestly, I mean, I do. I look at I look at Hoffman, and and I was never in that category. Jesus, I mean, Hoffman, God, it's amazing. And I look at DMC, and I'm like, Hoffman's a month older than me. DMC is a couple of years older, but, um, you know, and, and Volker and Blyther is still blasting. Um, Dominguez is actually getting back on it. He's had some bad back problems for a few, quite a few years. But uh, I look at my peers. I look at the guys, even if you're one month older than me, I'm like, all right, cool. I can still do it. It's yeah. not a competition. It's competition about your mind. It's not a competition. I'm not trying to compete with Matt. For, there's no competition. <laughs> it's Matt. <laughs> right. So, right. You know, but uh, just to be able to ride, I mean, I've actually just built my uh, another 2018 lineage sport. So, and what's that, about six months, I'm 49. So my 49th year, I'm thinking I'm putting 50 for 50. I'm going to do 50 tricks for my 50th. Um, so I've built that bike up and I want to do a 50 for 50. So <laughs> yeah, my man. guy, my guy right there. That sounds amazing. John I, need to keep, I need to keep going. Yeah, for sure. 
So, I mean, can, can we keep going? Are you good? Are you good to keep I'm going? I'm good. I'm, okay. I'm just drinking my scotch. If you guys are good. Yeah. Well, like we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up the first, the first part of episode one of that. Now we're, we're moving into episode two territory. So, right. uh, you know, Hey, tune in for next week's episode and we're going to, we're going to keep going with John and uh, we're going to talk with him some more. So tune in next week and you will hear the rest of this amazing interview with this legend of BMX.